All right, so here we are at chapter four. Finally, we'll be talking about proteins themselves. And I have to tell you that this is where the course really starts to pick up and, and get interesting. Not to say that the first two lectures were not interesting, but I think it's fair to say that the water lecture was largely review. And the amino acids lecture is, is kind of chemically. Um, I, I certainly can appreciate that. But as I said at the beginning of that lecture, if we're going to talk about proteins for much of the semester, it's critically important that we understand what makes up proteins, the building blocks of proteins. So we needed that background. Here we begin to talk about proteins themselves, specifically the structure of proteins. But we begin to understand how proteins do the jobs that they do. And this is where the course begins to get really interesting. So in this first half, this will be a, a two-half lecture series. The two chunks will only be that, two chunks. So in this first chunk, we'll talk about the levels of protein structure. We break protein structure up into four levels. We refer to them as primary, secondary, tertiary, and quaternary. And we'll be discussing only primary and secondary in this lecture chunk. In the next lecture, we'll finish that up and talk about tertiary and quaternary uh, structure, a little bit about how proteins fold, and we'll also have a single slide on how we um, look at the three-dimensional structure of proteins and how we measure the shape or, or view the shape of three-dimensional proteins. So as we said last week, proteins are chains of amino acids, and we talked about the formation of peptide bonds in that last lecture series, that dehydration reaction, and it's peptide bonds, those covalent bonds that hold amino acids together to form proteins. So this is what we mean by a chain of amino acids. If you look closely, you'll see that that first amino acid there is a lysine, followed by a valine, a phenylalanine, a glycine. And so this is what we mean by a chain, or in this case, a ribbon of individual amino acids held together by covalent bonds, peptide bonds. Proteins can, and the vast majority of proteins do, fold up into three-dimensional structures folding this ribbon into itself, almost like a fake knot or a pseudo knot of this ribbon, creating a three-dimensional structure. And so here, this image on the right kind of shows what a typical protein will fold up into. You can see it's kind of messy and it's kind of all glommed together there. We have some swirls or helices. We'll talk about that in a second. You can see these three-dimensional arrows. We'll talk about what those are too in just a moment. But this protein, this ribbon or chain of amino acids, has kind of double backed and rolled over and bent and twisted in on itself to create this three-dimensional, kind of knotted, kind of messy blob. We call this blob, or to say it a little bit more formally, we call this folding pattern a protein's conformation. Now, if you take any string or any ribbon, you can imagine that there are many, many different possible ways you can fold that ribbon up. So many, almost an infinite number of shapes and knots and folds and styles and globs that you could create. And the same is true for proteins. There's an, almost an infinite number of different shapes you can create with any chain of amino acids. But only one specific and unique shape is the correct one for a protein. And what we mean by correct is that only one will allow the protein to function the way that it's intended, will allow it to do, do the job that it's meant to do. And so this single conformation, that is the appropriate one, this single folded pattern of the amino acid chain that allows the protein to do its job is referred to as the native conformation. When it comes to proteins, and this is one of the mantras of this course, we say that structure equals function. That is to say that the shape the protein takes, that three-dimensional native conformation, the shape that the protein folds into, is what allows it to do its job. The protein's shape and structure allows it to do its function. So let's think about that for a moment. Structure equals function. Do we have any real-world examples of something like this? Well, as a matter of fact, we do. Look at this screw, this rusty, dirty old screw, and imagine that this screw is in the wall of my house. It's rusting. You can see it's staining the wall there. It's an eyesore. And so, of course, my wife says, get rid of that screw. Sick of looking at that screw. I want to paint it over. Get that screw out of the wall. So now I have a task. I need a tool that can remove that screw from the wall. So I go downstairs into my workroom. I find a nice ball-peen hammer. I find a beautiful 
nail gun. Nothing is more fun in the world than a nail gun. And I find a Phillips head screwdriver. Which one of these tools should I be using to achieve my job? Which one of these tools will have the appropriate function to remove that screw from the wall? And let me say, remember, the whole point of my wife asking me to get the screw out of the wall is so that it can be painted over and made nice. So I want to do as little damage to the wall as possible. Of course, it's the Phillips head screwdriver that I'm going to use. The reason I'm going to use that Phillips head screwdriver is because it's made to remove and unscrew and screw in screws like this. But look very closely at the end of that screwdriver. What allows this Phillips head screwdriver to do the job that I need it to do is the shape of its tip. The tip of a Phillips head screwdriver creates a plus, and that plus fits perfectly into the center of this screw. This tool is shaped to fit into this screw. The structure of this tool gives it the function that I'm after. So just as individual tools have a three-dimensional shape or function that allow them to do a very specific job and do it well, so too is the same for proteins. Proteins have a three-dimensional shape. And that shape, and only that shape, allows that protein to do its job and only that job. So you can think of proteins as microscopic or nano tools. They're nano machines that do the jobs that the cell needs done in order to survive. So now let's start to talk about the different levels of protein structure. Remember there are four, from primary to quaternary, but we'll only talk about the first two here. So proteins can fold up into many different shapes or conformations. We've said that already. And only one of those shapes is this correct shape that allows the protein to do its job. And again, we call that the native conformation. So let's do that. Let's fold a protein from a ribbon of amino acids, a chain of amino acids, into a fully folded conformation that can do its job. So the very first level of protein structure is primary structure. And the primary structure you already know We've already covered primary structure, we just haven't named it. Primary structure is just the chain of amino acids. It's the sequence of amino acids in the polypeptide chain. So here you're looking at an example of a primary structure. Every protein has its very first amino acid. Remember, that's the amino or N end. And those amino acids are linked together one by one through peptide bonds, creating a long chain. Each one of these circles is an amino acid until finally all the way at the end, you have a phenylalanine, a leucine, a serine, and that cysteine is the very last amino acid of the chain that's at the carboxy or C terminal end of the protein, of the uh, uh, chain of amino acids. So this is the primary structure of this protein, the chain or sequence of amino acids. Here's another example. Here every amino acid is, is named. Uh, the only difference here is that um, it's a little bit shorter, fewer amino acids in the chain, we see again that there's an amino terminal end with this glycine and the carboxy terminal end with this asparagine. And one difference here, we do see a disulfide bridge between these two cysteines, and we've talked about that already as well. So primary structure, the sequence of amino acids. While we're here, let's just discuss a few of the other um, concepts that we need to know from the last lecture. Uh, we have, again, an amino terminal end and a carboxy terminal end. Here we have a glycine. We know this is a glycine because the side chain is what? It's a single proton. Remember, this is the only non-chiral amino acid of all 20. And this is the peptide bond here between this carboxy terminal carbon and this amino terminal nitrogen. And here's the side chain of this alanine. It's a methyl group. And these side chains are in cis. This side chain is going up, this side chain is going down. This one's going up, this one's going down. This one's going up, this is going down. Down the line we go. Again, primary structure, just a chain of amino acids from the one end to the other. Our last example, primary structure, just the chain of amino acids going from one end to another. So, that's it. Primary structure. It's that easy. Really nothing more to know about it. We talked about this before in the last lecture, but keep in mind, directionality matters. Uh, in other words, the, the orientation of the sequence matters. Know that the amino terminal end is the beginning and the carboxy terminal end is the end. And the sequence of amino acids from beginning to end is important. We used the example of language in the last lecture to emphasize that and the words God and dog as our specific examples.
So when we talk about proteins, we always go from the amino terminal end to the carboxy terminal end. And so if I tell you that the sequence of a given protein is glycine, proline, phenylalanine, methionine, that is from N to C. The opposite orientation, methionine, phenylalanine, proline, glycine, is a completely different protein. Directionality matters. The primary structure is a one-dimensional structure. Uh, it's just linear. There's a beginning and an end, and then we are done. Uh, but it is our first step to get to that three-dimensional native conformation that we're after here in this, in this lecture series. So proteins fold into the shapes that they do because of the sequence of amino acids that there are. We'll touch on this a little bit later, but to emphasize this, it is the sequence or identity of the amino acids in the chain that cause that protein to spontaneously, all on its own, fold into the correct shape. So what I'm really saying is that it is the sequence of amino acids that give it its structure. It's the sequence of amino acids that cause it to fall into the native conformation that it assumes. So sequence dictates structure. And I already told you that structure dictates function. So now we have the bridge between the job the protein does in the cell and the sequence of the amino acids that make that protein up. In the back of your mind, I do want you to also be thinking about where that sequence of amino acids came from. It came from translation of a messenger RNA, which itself came from the transcription of a DNA gene. So the DNA gene held the information for the amino acid sequence. Transcription and translation allowed that amino acid sequence to be made. That specific sequence folded into a native conformation, and that specific shape had a specific function. Now the cell has a job being done that was needed in the cell to keep the cell alive. Pretty amazing stuff. Genes allow cells to have tasks completed because those genes encode proteins. So now we have primary structure already in the bag. It's the chain or sequence of amino acids from beginning to end. That allows us to bump up to secondary structure. Your textbook defines secondary structure as, quote, the hydrogen bonded arrangement of the backbone of the protein. And that's true, but really that kind of loses all the nuance and importance of what secondary structure really is. I like to think about secondary structure as regions of localized order in a larger, more ordered protein. And that's kind of the working definition I'd like you to get comfortable with in these next few slides. So let's use an, an analogy here, an example of what I mean. Here we're looking at a very ordered building. Buildings are very ordered. They're not chaotic. They're very structured. They're very um, repeating. I don't think anybody would kind of say that a building is just a random hodgepodge that was thrown together. It's a very ordered structure. It was built and designed. So here we have a building. And you can think of this as representing the entire folded and ordered protein. But we can also think of this building as a collection of smaller regions of localized order. Each floor of this building is a smaller subunit of localized order. Each floor has its own floor plan. Each floor plan is ordered and designated and characterized and compartmentalized. This floor plan is very ordered. And this building is made up of individual stacks of those ordered floors that come together to make the building. You can think of secondary structure as the individual small regions of local order that all together come to make the overall entire order or shape of the protein. So is it true that the third floor is part of the entire building? Absolutely. The third floor of this building is part of the entire building, and the building would not be complete without that third floor. But it's also equal to say that the third floor is its own region of local order. You can be on the third floor only and feel like you're in a very ordered environment, kind of forgetting that you're in the larger building itself. In very much the same way, secondary structures are part of the larger protein. Just like the third floor is part of the building, and the building would not be complete without the third floor, secondary structures are part of the entire protein, and the protein would not be complete without the secondary structures within it. But just as the third floor is its own localized region of order in the building, 
Secondary structures are again regions of localized order in the larger protein. So let's talk about what secondary structures really are at the biochemical level. If you think about a chain of amino acids, we have three covalent bonds uh, in that chain, three repeating covalent bonds. Of course, we have the peptide bond. We've already talked about that. And we've also discussed resonance, making the peptide bond uh, not allow rotation around it. That resonance stops free rotation around the peptide bond. If you're not familiar with what I'm saying, go back and review that chunk from lecture two. Uh, and that's important information. The other two bonds that we haven't really talked about, we've seen them, but we haven't talked about them, are single bonds that are part of the peptide chain. And since they're true single bonds, there's free rotation allowed across those bonds. These bonds are the bonds that hold the alpha carbon to the amino group on one side and the carboxy group on the other. So let's take a look at this, what we're talking about here. Here is the alpha carbon of a single amino acid. Here is the proton that every amino acid contains. And here is the variable group or side chain of this amino acid. This is the carboxy group of that amino acid. Here is the amino group of that amino acid. So this entire amino acid is represented here. That makes this a peptide bond with the next amino acid in the chain. And that makes this a peptide bond in the next amino acid in the chain. This peptide bond and this peptide bond have resonance. And therefore, free rotation is not allowed across it. But these other bonds, these single bonds of the amino acid itself, the bonds holding the alpha carbon to the carboxy and amino groups, these bonds are true single bonds. And as this picture shows, there is free 360 degree rotation allowable around these bonds. Because of this, we have a lot of flexibility around these bonds. This flexibility allows peptide chains, amino acid chains, to assume a pretty wide variety of different shapes. Two of these most common shapes, two of the most common secondary structures that we see in proteins, are referred to as alpha helices. And helices is just the plural of helix. So this is many, many individual alpha helix E's. And the other structure are beta sheets. Again, just like the third floor of the building, an alpha helix or a beta sheet is a single region of localized order within the larger protein. And just as multiple floors make up the building, multiple groups of alpha helices and beta sheets come together in the larger protein to make that entire protein form. So right now we're talking about an individual floor. We're talking about individual secondary structures. We'll build that larger protein in the next chunk of this lecture. <coughs> Excuse me. As the textbook referenced, that quote from the textbook on the last slide, the stability of these secondary structures are entirely dependent on hydrogen bonds. So let's talk about alpha helices first. An alpha helix is just that. It's a helix or a coil. It's a spiral staircase. It has a long, narrow shape. So here's an example of an alpha helix. Again, what do we see? We see a variable group or a side chain coming off the alpha carbon. Here's the amino group coming off that alpha carbon. This is a peptide bond to the next carboxy group, the alpha carbon there, and the amino group there. So this is a chain of amino acids, but no longer in primary structure, because this chain of amino acids is taking on a region of localized order. It's taking on this spiral shape of an alpha helix. This alpha helix is stabilized by hydrogen bonds that are parallel to the helix itself, and that are between the amino and carboxy groups of amino acids across the alpha helix itself. So if you can imagine a peptide, uh, I'm sorry, if you can imagine a hydrogen bond that's linking this carboxy carbon, or the oxygen of this carboxy carbon, to the hydrogens coming off this amino group, that hydrogen bond is going across this helix and stabilizing it, keeping it locked in place. So if we consider the primary structure of this chain of amino acids, again, just the region of, uh, or the chain or sequence of amino acids across it, we're talking about peptide bonds being static. We're talking about the other bonds that are not peptide bonds being flexible. And we're talking about the flexibility of these bonds allowing this chain or ribbon of amino acids to assume a helix shape. When they assume that helix shape, these dotted red lines are showing the hydrogen bonds, again, across the axis of that helix, running parallel to the helix, that kind of keep it in place. 
If you're struggling to visualize this in your mind, um, you can cut a small strip of paper, uh, cut it about a centimeter uh, wide, and wrap that paper around your finger. You're creating a helix with that paper you'll see that that paper really doesn't want to stay in that helix. It doesn't want to assume that shape. As soon as you let go of the paper, it's going to unravel from your finger. If you were to use narrow strips of tape to hold that paper in that helical conformation, you can then slide your finger out and you would have a beautiful helix of paper. What's holding that helix together would be the tape, the tape that you ran down the helix, um, down the axis of the helix. That tape that you placed to hold that helix in shape those are the hydrogen bonds from one amino acid to another, keeping that helix in place. Because the hydrogen bonds are running parallel to the helix, you can't have hydrogen bonds between adjacent amino acids. Instead, the carboxy group, again, the oxygen of the carboxy group of one amino acid, has a hydrogen bond to the hydrogen of the amino group of the amino acid residue four away in the chain. Let's show that here. Here is a hydrogen bond between this hydrogen of this amino group and this oxygen of this carboxy group. This is the hydrogen bond here. So if we call this amino acid number one, this here is amino acid number two, this back here is amino acid number three, and now here is amino acid number four in the chain of amino acids. This amino acid here in light gray is hydrogen bonded to this amino acid in light gray. But in the chain of amino acids, that's one, two, three, four amino acids away in the chain. And we can do it again here. We see another hydrogen bond off this amino group with this carboxy group. This hydrogen bond is between these two amino acids this light gray one here, and this narrow one that we're kind of looking at edge on. If this is amino acid number four, five, six, there's another one hidden back there, seven, eight amino acids. Again, four away in the chain. So we're always having hydrogen bonds with one amino acid and the next amino acid that's four away in the chain. You can get a better look at this if you navigate to this website. Unfortunately, this isn't a live link, so if you click on the slide right now, nothing's going to happen. But if you pause the slide and copy this URL into your browser, it'll take you to a, a nice quiz that'll kind of walk you through the formation of alpha helices, including these um, hydrogen bonds, and kind of, again, walk you through it and then let you see it built in real time. So if you're struggling to conceptualize this, and again, it's a lot to have in your head, then I recommend you take a few minutes right now and kind of brush up on this uh, online tutorial. So when it comes to larger proteins, it's not required that a protein have an alpha helix to form. There are some proteins that have no alpha helices in them. Other proteins have nothing but alpha helices in them, and it's much more common that a protein is made up of some alpha helices, some beta sheets, and other structures as well. When it comes to the stability of alpha helices, the amino acid proline, remember proline's that wonky one where the side chain double backs and interacts with the amino group. Remember we showed that? It's almost like a ring, but that ring terminates with the amino group of that amino acid. Proline disrupts alpha helices. It is that weirdo wonky shape that doesn't allow proline to kind of flexibly fit into the repeating and tight coiling pattern of a helix. Because there's no free rotation between the alpha carbon and the amino group in proline, we don't get this nice, flexible spiraling that we need for an alpha helix to be stable. <clears throat> side chains can also disrupt an alpha helix, especially if those side chains are large. Too many large side chains in a row can disrupt the stability of an alpha helix. Uh, too many side chains of the same charge in a row can do the same. Essentially, if any side chain is too close to another that's getting in its way, either electrostatically or just in mass, we can have the disruption of the alpha helix. That's because in alpha helices, those side chains are projecting out of the helix itself. This is a truer, more accurate represent representation of an alpha helix. The actual peptide backbone is grayed out. This cylinder is meant to represent the peptide backbone itself. And all this stuff that you see emanating from that peptide backbone, these are side chains. So the side chains are kind of flying out from this helix in all directions.
um, technically in cis, but because of the repeating pattern of the helix, they're just flying out in all directions. And so if you have two positive side chains that are too close together, they'll repel electrostatically. If you have very, very large rings, like this ring, aromatic ring here, and this one here, this is tyrosine, if these were too close together, they would both be competing for the same amount of room, and you would have steric interference, and they would push each other away from one another in that way, too. <clears throat> so on to beta sheets. Uh, when it comes to beta sheets, this is completely different from an alpha helix. It's a secondary structure, so it's a region of localized order. Um, but it's a different type of floor or region of localized order in that building of the protein. When it comes to beta sheets, the peptide backbone is completely extended. There's no tight coiling. It's almost as though the ribbon of amino acids is allowed to be that stretched out ribbon. That stretched out ribbon form of a beta sheet can kind of double back on itself like a switchback trail going up or down a mountain. And you can have different peptides lining up next to each other. So that's what we're trying to show here. If we come at the beginning of this protein, we'll see that we go from, and, and each one of these arrows is a beta strand, an individual component of a beta sheet. This whole structure that we're looking at here is a beta sheet. We see that this one beta sheet goes in this direction and then double backs and goes here, and then we loop again, and it goes here, and we double back and we go here, and that's the end of that one structure, these four beta strands making up that sheet. And then we have another sheet here that's uh, kind of coexisting with us. If we get a little bit more of a drill down look into this beta sheet, again, we're looking at uh, the amino acid peptide backbone here. These red groups are the side chains. The side chains are in their cis configuration, up, down, up, down, up, down. And we can see that this um, chain of amino acids is fully linear. It's all stretched out. It's uh, zigging and zagging back on itself and stabilizing these beta strands, these individual beta strands into this larger beta sheet are dot 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 hydrogen bonds secondary structures are always uh, stabilized by hydrogen bonds it's one of their hallmark features and so these hydrogen bonds that we see here these dotted lines are keeping these individual beta strands close together and stable with one another to create this beta sheet we can have intra-chain hydrogen bonds or interchain hydrogen bonds what we mean by that is uh, any hydrogen bond between these two beta sheets would be intra-chain because this is one single chain of amino acids. Uh, and then inter-chain would be when hydrogen bonds are keeping the beta strands of one chain of amino acids hydrogen bonded and stable with a beta strand from a very far or different protein's beta sheet. Uh, the way I keep that straight in my mind is interstate highways allow you to go from one state to another. Interstate 90 will bring you all the way to New York. So I always think of inter as connecting different things. So interchain hydrogen bonds will connect different proteins together. Intrachain is all within the single same protein. Uh, we also have some more kind of fine-tuning terminology. If the, beta, the, if the peptide chains, these beta strands, run in the same direction as each other with regards to the amino to carboxy orientation, we call that a parallel beta sheet. So we see an example of that here. Uh, the top beta strand is going from N to C, right to left. The bottom beta strand is going from N to C, right to left. And they're hydrogen bonded to each other. We would call that a parallel beta sheet because the strands are running in the same direction. You can probably see where I'm going with this. If we have more of this switchback thing where the beta strands themselves are doubling back on themselves in this kind of orientation, where we go from beginning to end left to right, and then we loop, and we come from beginning to end right to left, and then we have an anti-parallel beta sheet. Anti-parallel beta sheets are more stable. You might be able to pick out why just by looking at these diagrams. The hydrogen bonds of anti-parallel beta sheets have less stress upon them. Uh, they're a little bit more linear, and they're perpendicular to the beta sheets themselves, the beta strands themselves. The hydrogen bonds in parallel beta sheets uh, are a little bit more stretched, asked to be a little bit longer, and there's a little bit more tension on those. Beta sheets can also be referred to as pleated sheets. I'll never use that term, but you may hear that term in other courses or maybe standardized exams or in graduate school. They're called uh, pleated sheets because they do this kind of ziggy-zaggy, puckered appearance. A, a true beta sheet looks like this. Again, here's a beta strand, right? We're going from beginning to end here. It's the side chains that are in yellow, up, down, up, down, up, down. And here is the other beta 
strand here as well. And they're hydrogen bonded to each other. You can see those dotted red lines keeping it stable. And the beta sheets themselves are kind of zigging down and zigging up and zigging down and zigging up. And that's why they're called these pleated sheets. The hydrogen bonds are always perpendicular to the peptide bonds in one direction. The side chains are perpendicular to the peptide bonds in the other direction. What in the world are we trying to say there? Uh, well, if you think about it, uh, pick up two pens or two pencils, if you would. Hold one pencil or pen in front of you so that it's flat, so that the point of the pencil is facing to the left and the end of the pencil, the eraser end of the pencil, is facing to the right or the clicker part of the pen is to the right and the point of the pen is to the left. And imagine that is the direction of your peptide bond. Now take the other pencil and put it in the center of the first, but make that pencil point away from you. So keep them perpendicular to one another, but make that pencil point away from you. So that you almost have a T that fell over onto its side and you're looking down on that T closer to its top. That second pencil that you just put into place, that is the hydrogen bond orientation. Perpendicular to the peptide bonds and going in one direction, a direction away from you. All right, now take that second pencil away. Back to the peptide bonds as they were. Take that same pencil and put it on in the center of the first, but now on top of it so that it's perpendicular but facing upwards. Now you should be looking at the two as though it's an upside down T and you're looking straight on at it. That second pencil represents the bond to the side chain, to the variable group. Still perpendicular to the peptide bond, but now perpendicular in a different direction. So let's go back to the diagram on the screen in front of you and go back to the text. The hydrogen bonds are perpendicular to the peptide bonds in one direction. Here are the peptide bonds going across the screen from left to right. The hydrogen bonds are perpendicular going into the screen away from you. The side chains are also perpendicular to the peptide bonds, but in the other direction. These side chains are perpendicular to the left-right orientation of the peptide bonds, but perpendicular because they go up or down at right angles, creating upside-down T's or right-side-up T's, depending on the cis configuration of those side chains. That leads us to the last large group of secondary structures, kind of a catch-all miscellaneous group that contains terms, motifs, and domains. Again, alpha helices and beta sheets, they're great, but they don't really do us any good unless we can connect them to one another and give a three-dimensional shape. Individual floors of a building are wonderful, but you can't have a building unless you can connect those individual floors into a single cohesive building. So we have to somehow get these secondary structures linked to one another. We have to get these individual alpha helices that you see here, which are each individual secondary structures, and we have to have a way by which we can link them together to create what you're looking at, which is a fully folded three-dimensional protein. A protein that has a specific shape, giving it a particular structure. And as you can see on the screen, this is hemoglobin, so we know the function of this protein. We know the structure of this protein gives it the function of carrying oxygen. So linking these secondary structures together requires some pretty sharp turns, and we can see that here. We have some pretty sharp turns that are drawing these um, alpha helices to one another. Glycine is typically seen in sharp turns for good reason. Glycine has the smallest side chain, and it can accommodate the most tension of twisting or torquing for a sharp turn. Again, that small single protein side chain allows glycine to be deformed um, more than any other amino acid, allowing it to participate in sharp turns. Proline is often seen in sharp turns because proline is turning anyway. That weird kind of doubling back side chain linking to the amino group is pulling proline into a near right angle all on its own. If you think of all of the amino acids as having a general linear structure, proline is more like an L being pulled and distorted into a downward structure. So proline is great for turns because proline is kind of turning all by itself anyway. It's that static rigidity and turning of proline that makes it awful for alpha helices, but makes it very good for turns. So in fact, one of the most common sharp turn structures that we see are proline glycine turns or PG turns. Proline starts that sharp twisting turn, 
and glycine accommodates it because it has such a small side chain. Motifs are a larger catch-all. Motifs are small collections of multiple secondary structures that are commonly found together, and they do some particular conserved function or job. Here's some examples of common motifs. We have a alpha helix beta sheet motif. We have a helix turn helix motif. This is one of the most common motifs in molecular biology. It's called helix turn helix for good reason. That's what it is. Uh, this is a barrel, a beta sheet barrel uh, motif as well. And again, so we're back to helix turn helix. Helix turn helix motif is important in molecular biology because it's a DNA binding motif. Remember, we said that uh, motifs are small collections of secondary structures that usually have a conserved function. The conserved function of the helix turn helix motif is to bind to DNA, or said more appropriately, to allow the protein it's part of to bind to DNA. The reason why the helix turn helix motif is so suited for DNA binding is because one of these helices fits perfectly into the major groove of the DNA double helix. For those of you who have had cell and molecular biology, you know all about the major groove. Even if you're taking the two courses at the same time right now, we've already talked about the major groove in that course. So access to the bases occurs in the major groove, and this alpha helix fits perfectly right into that major groove, allowing the protein to make those contacts. So if a motif is a small collection of secondary structures that are typically found together and allow uh, the protein to have some function or have some conserved job, what are domains? Well, domains also have controlled or conserved function, but domains are usually bigger. They contain more secondary structures. More importantly, though, the defining characteristic of a domain is that it is modular. What we mean by that is if you were able, or and this is possible using um, biochemical and recombinant techniques, if you were able to snip a domain out of the larger protein it's part of. It's as if you could remove a single floor of a building uh, and have that floor stay intact. That domain would retain its function even outside of the context of the larger protein. So there are DNA binding domains as well. And if you separate a DNA binding domain from the rest of the protein it's part of, that domain all by itself will still bind to DNA. That's the defining characteristic. The same is not true for motifs. Motifs do not retain their function when they are separated from the larger protein. So we talked about the helix turn helix motif being a DNA binding motif. If you were to cut a helix turn helix motif out of the larger protein that it's part of, it would not be able to bind DNA any longer. Motifs do not retain their function when separated from their proteins, and domains do. So to summarize this first half of this lecture, we talked about three-dimensional shapes that proteins can take, that ribbons of amino acids can fold into three-dimensional shapes, and those three-dimensional shapes are referred to as conformations. But since for a protein it has to have a specific job that requires a specific structure, that one shape that a protein folds into in three dimensions that is the appropriate and correct shape is called its native conformation. Once a protein assumes that native conformation, and is folded into its correct three-dimensional shape, it can now do its job. And the reason for that is because structure equals function with proteins. We talked about primary structure, which is nothing more than the sequence of amino acids that makes that protein what it is. And then we moved quickly on to secondary structures, where we talked quite a bit about alpha helices, what they are, how they look, how they form, how they're stabilized. We did the same for beta sheets. And then we talked a bit about terms as well. We ended the lecture talking about motifs and domains, both of them regions of secondary structure that have conserved function and allow a protein to do a specific task relevant to its overall job, but the difference is that motifs must be in the context of the larger protein to have that function, whereas domains are modular and will retain that function even if removed from the larger protein. So that's the first chunk of this two-chunk lecture series. We'll kind of finish this discussion up in the next chunk where we'll talk about tertiary and quaternary structure. And as I said, we'll finish that up talking about, well, how do we see these in proteins? How can we visualize these structures in proteins at all? So as always, thanks for watching and see you in the next chunk.